Thank you so much. Okay, so this is the portion where we try to be uh, a, a bit more applied and look at a number of specific business models. Uh, we'll look a little bit, we started already talking about uh, ad tech cookies tracking, we'll look at that a little more broadly. Obviously the differences in mobile and uh, IoT. Uh, and we'll look at also at the uh, connected cars. We have a big project globally on the future of mobility, the system that uh, is necessary for uh, cars and other transportation which will rely on vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, vehicle-to-infrastructure communication, much more of a data-related ecosystem, so obviously creates lots of uh, uh, interesting uh, issues with GDPR. And then hopefully we'll look at a couple of other issues uh, as well, and so as always we'll take uh, as many questions as we can. All right, I turn over to Gabe, who now needs no introduction to start. Thanks, Jules. Uh, so we're, we're going to start with ad tech, and we thought it would be useful to focus um, first on some of the questions we saw coming up already in the context of uh, consent. Um, so this is the issue of what do we do about cookies, um, and how are we managing tracking on our websites. We'll then um, dive into ad tech more broadly, um, if there are questions on that. Uh, but we thought it'd be helpful to give you an overview of the framework since um, I assume most of your organizations have websites. This is going to uh, apply to most of you. Uh, so to begin with, uh, we need to remind you of a couple things. The first is that, remember we had those three circles for what is the, where the GDPR applies to you. There's territorial scope, material scope, um, subject matter, uh, and um, all of that is captured in that one uh, circle. So the GDPR is one law that we need to think about when we're, we're talking about um, cookies and advertising. Uh, but there's, there's a whole lot of other stuff going on in this space. Uh, my clicker's not working. Oh, there we go. Uh, so, and the big piece of legislation to watch for here is the e-privacy directive. This is uh, an EU level directive, so remember it's not transposed, uh, it's not applied directly into member state law, but needs to be uh, transposed. So there is some variation across the EU member states. It's a directive that dates back to 2002 and has been um, amended since then. Um, and uh, it applies um, not to personal data, but to any information that's uh, collected from an individual's device, um, and it also applies to um, storing information on an individual's device. So uh, cookies very clearly stored on a user's device, but also accessing information from someone's device, ac accessing their advertising ID, for example, is going to trigger this um, e-privacy directive. Uh, and then the last piece to be aware of is that there are a number of um, standards organizations in the advertising space. Um, it, that apply self-regulatory rules, um, and these will be important too because um, they, can, they can limit what you're able to do. So let's focus on the e-privacy directive because this is really the big one. Um, Article 5.3 of the e-privacy directive says that where you're storing information on someone's terminal equipment, that's, that's the word they use, think device, uh, or you're accessing information that's stored on the person's device, then you need to get the consent of, um, of the user or the subscriber. And um, here's where the overlap with GDPR becomes important because e -privacy, the e-privacy directive does not define consent. The definition of consent comes from GDPR. So in essence, we have um, a, a directive that applies to a broader set of data than GDPR. We don't care whether it's personal data, we just care whether it's been taken from someone's device, but we apply the GDPR concept of consent to that. Um, and that, that starts to create a number of problems um, or a number of challenges. So we'd, we'd heard in Gabriella and Carolina's session about the different legal bases you can use for processing and consent was just one of them. They explained that there's no preference for consent over any others um, when you're doing ordinary processing. But when we're in this e-privacy directive space, when we're collecting information from a user's device, we have to get consent for that. So what are some of the issues? 
Um, I've taken some quotes from the, the working party language, which highlight the nature of, of the issue when, um, when we're dealing with cookies specifically. Um, so the first is this question of what's unambiguous affirmative consent. Um, the, the working party guidance said, the EDPV guidance says that merely continuing the ordinary use of a website um, should not be an indication of consent. Um, and I know we've, we've touched on that before, but we'll, we'll get to the consequences of that in a minute. The second I want to highlight is that um, any party that relies on consent needs to get certain minimum information uh, to the individual. And uh, a key piece of minimum information you need to get to the individual is who you are. So you can't get freely given specific informed consent if the data subject has no idea who's collecting their data. Um, so when you have a website, uh, then clearly you're identified. But think about all those other um, players in the advertising ecosystem who are also uh, collecting device level data. Um, each of them are going to have to rely on consent and um, this minimum set of information needs to be provided and, and that creates a, a huge problem or a huge challenge, I should say. The third is the specificity of consent. Uh, so, yeah, we have a question. Uh, so, the responsibility lies with uh, the data controllers, and there are going to be lots of different data controllers in this environment. Uh, so, if you're the uh, owner of the website, then you have responsibilities to get meaningful consent for anything that's under your control. Uh, but if you are using um, advertising agencies that are acting as controllers, they also have responsibility for what they're doing. Uh, but clearly, there's only one website where we can get this information in front of individuals, so um, it has to be worked out between the parties. There needs to be um, agreements that, that um, allows each party to meet their own independent obligations. So consent needs to be granular and specific. This means that it needs to be uh, a separate consent for different processing purposes. I, I struggle with what's a different processing purpose, purpose, but it does seem that um, in the advertising space there seem to be differentiations between um, analytics and um, advertising um, and performance related cookies. And so when you're thinking about what the specific purposes are, uh, that's sort of the level of detail that, that we're seeing across the industry. Um, but does this mean then that you would need to get a separate opt-in for each? Um, that, that's one of the challenges that comes up. And the last challenge I want to point out, uh, because um, we see this issue a lot, is uh, that it has to be as easy to withdraw consent as it was to give it. Now historically, if uh, any of you have ever um, actually read through these cookie policies, and we know most people don't, uh, but historically the way that people have been given a right to withdraw their consent has been through their browser settings. But clearly, continuing to use a website or clicking I accept is uh, a lot easier um, than going to configure my browser so that it stops setting the cookies. Um, so, so that's another driver, key driver of changes. So what's the consequence of this? Well, the first thing is that we need this unambiguous affirmative consent, which means you cannot be setting cookies before you place the browser, uh, before you, um, the individual has taken that unambiguous affirmative action. Um, and this is where um, there's a change from current practice. On a lot of websites you visit right now, the banner pops up and immediately you see 30 cookies are set at the same time before anyone's taken any, um, any action. Um, the GDPR is quite clear that that's not going to work because you need to have taken, taken some, some action to signal the consent. Where it's not clear is whether, um, to what extent continuing to use the website can be that affirmative action. Um, so the working party guidance says merely scrolling probably is not an affirmative action. But there's some indication that if, if the individual clicks on a link, that that might, might be enough of a signal. Um, if you're clear in the banner that clicking on links within the website will, will allow the cookies to drop. And uh, 
Jules was talking about the CNEEL website earlier. This is the French regulator's website. That seems to be the approach they've taken. When you first visit their, uh, their website, they have just one really benign tracking cookie. Uh, but if you click on other links, then suddenly um, a handful of other cookies pop up. Um, some of them are social media cookies. So, so they, they seem to be taking the view that clicking links on a website um, is better than scrolling and shows that clear affirmative action. The other approach we've seen uh, organizations take is like the one that's screenshotted here uh, from Bloomberg, um, not a client, full disclaimer. Um, and uh, what, what they've done and what you'll see more and more in the market is these really, really prominent banners. And this is because the uh, EDPB guidance says that the reason scrolling isn't good enough as an, uh, as an affirmative consent is because it's possible that the individual didn't see the banner and therefore wasn't making that decision. So they're taking the view that if you have a really, really prominent banner, then um, continuing to use the website would be consent because, well, how could you use the website without engaging with that banner? The other consequence of what we've discussed is uh, that third parties that are acting as controllers likely will need to be named. So these are your um, advertising exchanges um, and, and other organizations that um, are collecting data from your website. Um, and so if you look in this example, when you click in um, more information, you actually get a, a list of all the different parties that are, um, that are setting cookies on the website. Um, so this isn't necessarily to meet the website owner's requirements, but um, as part of getting consent for all the other parties involved in the ad tech space, it really is the only option uh, for, for them to get the consent they need. And then last, we talked about um, the right to withdraw consent and how easy that needs to be. So browser settings don't work. Um, what we're seeing instead is people moving towards cookie consent management solutions which allow you to, um, like in this case, if you click more information, you can um, turn on or turn off different cookies or different purposes. Um, and that gives you um, the granular choices you need to meet your requirements, but also makes it um, easy to withdraw consent um, in a way that doesn't point people to their browser settings. So that's the e-privacy directive. Um, unfortunately, there's a bit of uncertainty because we have some new law on the way. Uh, there's been a proposal for an e-privacy regulation, um, which would also harmonize the rules across the EU, um, and hopefully will make life uh, simpler because you won't have to look to member state requirements. Um, and it's worth noting that there are um, a lot of changes from the e-privacy regulation that affect um, organizations that, um, like connected cars, that are um, collecting and exchanging device data. But for ad tech, a lot of these changes are driven just by the nature of what consent means under GDPR. And so um, some of these changes won't be as significant, but some points to look out for are right now, you need consent for any cookies that are not strictly necessary for the, for the purpose uh, of providing the service. Um, so for example, basic analytics isn't strictly necessary to provide a website. And so under current law, you do need consent. Uh, one thing we're looking at in the privacy regulation is the possibility for an exemption for first party analytics, which would mean you don't need to get consent for that. Um, there could be new rules that change um, the definition of consent even more broadly, uh, that um, impose, um, for example, browser level controls that would allow you to select um, from consent either in or out uh, across all websites rather than having to engage with a banner on each website. Um, and um, there's been the suggestion of a possibility to rely on legitimate interests, which would help deal with some of the data sharing that happens um, on the back end um, after, after the data has been collected. So this, exactly. So if you're doing 
analytics on your own site for your own benefit. You, not a third party. You, you can be engaging a third party, uh, but if they're acting on your behalf only and not then aggregating that information and taking it across um, to create behavioral profiles that, that follow the people, then, then that would be first party. It, yeah, I mean, the, the terms in the advertising and marketing world, right, we have to be careful when we say first party, third party, right? I think what we're are suggesting is that not sharing data, right? Always, it's, it's always easier to use data and then once one's sharing it with unrelated third parties, clearly that's a high significant, you know, out of context secondary use. Uh, and then uh, number two, what is the use? Is it creating a profile view to tailor content specifically to you? Again, a more robust use. So simple analytics, Google Analytics, um, any use to understand the usage of your site. It's, I think, well accepted that you can't put on a site and understand uh, how to be sure people are getting content and how to make it function without using a degree of tracking in order to understand the site usage. So I think legally or optics and perception well, legally the issue with a big player might be who's defining all the specific uses right uh, are they truly acting solely as a processor so google has very recently provided more specificity because they maintain that for google analytics they are a processor and aren't using the data beyond the defined uses. So from a legal point of view, um, the notion that a processor who's fully under your control shouldn't be treated and shouldn't be considered any differently from you doing the activity yourself. Now, yes, obviously there's optics, and do we have the transparency, and do we trust it, and so on and so forth, but I'd suggest there are lots of very big platforms and internet infrastructure where we don't even ask that question because we, we, you know, we have a sort of a history. Obviously, the analytics companies and ad tech gets complicated because the same companies that are doing analytics are doing advertising and doing third-party advertising, so maybe the good thing for you know, ad tech is that a lot of the obscurity where you couldn't even tell if you were doing business with various parties what the full range of their activities were, that has been exposed because you, you can't conceivably be getting consent or treating them as a processor. So you have seen, if you've watched, all of the third-party ad tech, at least the big players who you know are spending a lot of time and energy and are under the uh, eye of regulators, for the first time sometimes being much more detailed, much more specific, um, and laying out the parameters because otherwise nobody was comfortable that they would actually be a, uh, a processor. So that's been maybe some overdue, you know, uh, uh, challenges that haven't been previously um, as spelled out. Uh, at least GDPR sort of shines the light for the first time uh, uh, on that. Has anybody, let me just also ask, has anybody gone through the process here of the IAB uh, EU uh, consent and transparency solution? Because, no. Yeah, some, I see some, some yeses. Um, do, we, do we have that in here or should we talk about it a little bit? Uh, yeah, right? So as this process came along, obviously much of the third party ad tech world looked at it and said, okay, I have a big problem because I'm a controller to some degree. Certainly all of the companies that do take data and use it for advertising and marketing across uh, uh, various sites. And I need some way to get publishers or advertisers, right, because sometimes they're collecting and retargeting and the like. I need some way to get permission. Um, and uh, by the way, there's hundreds of us uh, who are typically doing business, third-party exchanges, data exchanges. Uh, we need some cooperation. And of course, it's always hard to get cooperation uh, in this sector, given the, the challenges. Um, the effort that probably got the most scale uh, is uh, an effort that was put together the, by the IAB uh, Europe, uh, and they created a system where third parties can declare the different purposes, 
that they uh, do with data, um, register themselves that this is what they do, fit into a framework so that uh, if I'm a publisher uh, and I want to use third-party ad tech, I can pop a banner, uh, a, a window, I guess you probably shouldn't even call it a banner, um, that allows the display of some number of the third parties, or at least a place to easily click and see all of the possible third parties that the publisher is approving as feasible to appear on their site. So in the past, you didn't necessarily even know who the third parties were. You were relying on your agency or some other third party who was handing data off to many other third parties. In theory now, you can approve from the companies that are on the list these are the 12, the 15, the 18 that I understand that I'm approving uh, to appear on my site. I'm now able to pull them into this UI as well as the list of the different purposes that they provide and options to opt in or opt out to each of those. Now, what the IAB doesn't want to do is mandate, given this disparity on can you scroll and click and to accept? Do I have to expressly click and accept um, exactly how to implement it? So they leave that a bit to the uh, the publishers, and you're seeing some people, you know, live with the accept by clicking on anything on the site. Um, will the regulators accept this or not? Um, uh, they're looking at it. Um, there's not many other solutions that are out in, in the market, so I imagine maybe they'll give them some feedback. Um, you know, again, in my discussions with some of the regulators uh, about it, um, the cons they, they seemed generally comfortable with the notion of agreeing. They seemed a little bit uncomfortable with the notion of, wait, there's 100 companies that you have agreed to? How, how do you show 100 companies? Google getting that same feedback that, that I did, uh, as well as some of the other uh, companies, um, initially was going to develop its own consent manager and only show 12. And they said, nobody can do business with more than 12 because you can't really show more than 12. Once you have 100, you, you have to click to pages and it becomes you know, not feasible. They got a lot of pushback from other publishers, why are you telling me I can only do business with 12? Uh, it's my business to decide. It's not your business, right? So they said, yeah, but that's what the regulators are telling us, that there's no easy way to consent. So it went back and forth, and Google now is integrating with the IAB solution so that people don't have to go. The, the concern was I'll either use Google's sort of framework or the IABs, and then both, and and then it becomes a bit of a, a complication because people want to use the Google services, but they also maybe want to use some other third-party ad tech. So Google is now integrating with the IAB one. So it seems to be the main course of action. So there's some safety in kind of you know going with the industry solution. And presumably the regulators, if they push or poke, maybe it'll happen at a holistic uh, level, right? The, the risk for a lot of people here isn't uh, you know choosing to go with the standard. It's not knowing exactly where the line will be, either being too conservative and telling your company, we can't do this, we can't do this, and then all your competitors do it, and like, what kind of advice did you give? Or, or you know, the reverse, um, you know, taking a liberal position and everybody else has, has settled. So to the extent that we, we, the community, uh, are able to establish some norms, some standards, some practices, where, you know, you can have some comfort that the interpretation is not yours, and then you're the subject of you know the criticism, uh, but that it's more of a back and forth, uh, and the regulators are very much open to that. Yeah. That's exactly what this does. It creates a, a method to give all of the different third parties and their different uses. So yes. Yeah, so it's not the website's responsibility to do that, but all those third parties are independently responsible for doing so. Yeah. And so what, but so what they're doing is they're saying, if you're gonna use our cookie, then um, in your contract they say, you have to give notice of who we are um, and where people can get more information about what we do. So it becomes your responsibility. Um, and there have been a number of publishers, so websites have been pushing back on this, um, but it, in practice, it's the only way for all these players to get the consent they need, so there's not, not a ton of traction there. Dan, Dan disagrees. Yeah, well, there are some 
It appears that Google is now combining with the IAB EU effort because of some of the concerns about two different paths. Right. And then let's talk mobile for a second. This is primarily a cookie-based mechanism, but as you heard Gabe explain, that there's nothing that's cookie unique. Uh, the the uh, law covers tracking, and so the mobile ad identifiers of uh, of apps are are certainly uh, to be captured here. And there are a few companies that um, uh, are working with SDKs that seek to make it easy to invoke other third parties, but it's a little bit less robust, a little bit less uh, mature. Uh, obviously, you, it's hard to have multiple SDKs with competing sort of consent mechanisms, so that's evolving and people are catching up. I think the regulators understand that the web-based cookie thing is probably the, the forefront, um, uh, but very quickly you're seeing some of the mobile companies, a couple of uh, uh, Israeli mobile sort of app players who, for, for whom this was very important because they're you know, providing analytic services, they're providing ad tech, that sort of built versions uh, of this. Uh, so I urge you to take a look at them if you're doing anything with a, uh, a mobile app that is captured by this. Yeah, we have a question. So it's a good question and a related point um, because um, electronic direct marketing is also governed by this e-privacy directive. Um, and so what that means is, as a directive, there are, there are variations in member state law. Um, so you will have to look jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Um, if you need to get consent, then you need to think about how you're getting consent. Sending um, a message that has an unsubscribe at the bottom is not consent. Uh, but you don't always need consent. So um, there's what's called the soft opt-in exemption, um, where you have an existing business relationship, where you've obtained an individual's contact details in the context of a sale of a product or service, and you gave them the chance to opt out at the time when you collected their details, and the marketing is sent by the same legal entity that collected their details and relates, the marketing relates to similar products or services, then you can send it without consent. You have that, that soft opt-in exemption. And some member states allow for marketing to businesses um, without consent, but that really varies. Um, and I just want to remind people, obviously we'll talk, uh, maybe Limor or Dan will talk about the, uh, the Israeli you know, email uh, spam uh, laws as well as uh, the other issues. Um, but if you're doing open rate tracking, you're setting a cookie or firing a pixel, um, making sure you're giving a disclosure and a choice if appropriate for that, uh, really critical to do. So I would hesitate if I didn't have a, 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 a site that at least gave somebody some information when I registered an email that indicated that I was going to track uh, open rates and so forth, to do so simply because you gave me an email and I send you and boom, you know, I set the cookie and I track you without uh, uh, anything before that. So certainly you want to pay attention to that. Right. I mean, typically the most we'll see in an email is a link saying, a, a disclosure perhaps saying, hey, this email, you know, tracks open rate and link here to see more details and to make some choices. Right. It's usually too late. You opened it up already. I did the tracking. So I either spammed you already or I tracked you already. So you're, you're not gaining anything by a, a consent in the email. So e-privacy regulation on its way, it was supposed to be here at the same time as GDPR. It's clearly not, um, and it's currently stalled um, as there's a change in presidency. Um, so we uh, are still waiting for um, a final text on that. Yeah, just um, to give you a, a bit of more details there. Uh, so the proposal of the commission was published at the beginning of uh, 2017. 
uh, it, with the intention to have it already adopted by, by all EU institutions and also applicable the same day with the GDPR. Obviously, that did not happen. Um, right now, we have uh, the report adopted by the European Parliament, so the mandate of the European Parliament to negotiate uh, these um, provisions. Uh, we have an intermediary text that is still being worked on in the, uh, in the European Council. Um, and we are, at this point, waiting for the Council to adopt its mandate, to adopt its version of the text. Uh, and then, uh, after this will happen, and this is the process that got uh, uh, very long uh, also this time, so after the Council adopts it, adopts it uh, the European Commission, the European Parliament with its uh, mandate and the Council will meet in something that's informally called a trilogue, and then they will negotiate once more on the text. As things are right now, uh, there have been public uh, opinions expressed publicly last week uh, by uh, former MEP Jan Albrecht, saying that it's very likely we will not have the e-privacy regulation adopted uh, before the, European, the new ele elections for the European Parliament, which are supposed to take place next year, end of spring, probably. I don't know exactly the date. Yeah. So I think we have more time to breathe uh, on this, uh, at least uh, digest first the GDPR before laying this additional level of activity. Uh, just a couple of quick points to make, however. It, it does appear that it's going to happen at some point, yeah. whether it's a year, year and a half, whatever the process will be. Um, remember, it's not just cookies and tracking. This captures now all IoT devices. So if you're doing Wi-Fi analytics, counting the number of phones in a space, if you're doing you know, anything with smart home devices, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle transportation, smart cars, so it's you know, huge in scope, at least right now. There are some efforts to sort of narrow uh, some, of, uh, some of this. Um, uh, the second uh, point is that the Belgian presidency is, is you know, finished. They were making this a bit of a priority, but... The Bulgarian was... presidency. Bulgarian, yeah, sorry. For six months, um, the Austrian presidency. The new presidency is the Austrian presidency. Um, they were the ones who voted against GDPR because it wasn't strict enough. Um, <laughs> They were the only, were the only no vote? Yeah, yeah. They were the only no vote? I think there was an abstention by somebody also? Uh, yeah, I, I oh, they were the only no vote. Um, however, that was abstention. the previous uh, government. Uh, the new government, um, you know, is more of a, a, a right-wing government, obviously, um, and it seems their very big priority is migration issues, and so where exactly this will be in their sort of agenda of, you know, driving issues through, we, we don't know. Presumably, it's, it's been a priority for you know, the, the uh, various European actors, so it'll be on the agenda, but whether it's item number one or item number five, um, there's a change in politics. Um, yeah. okay. All right, a, a last quick point on um, ad tech before we move on to connected cars, and that's just that, um, remember the right to be forgotten? Well, Article 19 extends the right to be forgotten to any third party that's received the data as well. You have an obligation to inform all those third parties. So think about that list of um, dozens or potentially more um, organizations that are um, collecting data on your website. If someone makes a right to be forgotten request, then you'd have to inform all of them. Again, that's the value, for better or worse, of some of these industry solutions. They're set up to be able to create like a daisy chain to pass permission down the line, if you've gotten permission, you know, for a group of activities, or to pass the deletion, the, the objection down the line as well. So in some strange way, you, you're forcing kind of a unique ID agglomeration, uh, you know, which is probably a negative privacy thing, for the purpose of being able to pass along that this unique user is the one who wants to be tracked or doesn't want to be tracked or wants their data deleted. So whether in the scheme of things it improves privacy, it certainly improves the ability for the system to communicate users' preferences, which hopefully is a big advance. Um, thank you, Jules. Uh, so we're going to move now to uh, connected cars um, and the GDPR. It's sort of an uncharted territory, but we are trying to make charts about it uh, to be helpful. <laughs> 
so this is um, a, a very, very useful uh, graphic uh, that the Future of Privacy Forum um, created. And as part of our work on connected cars, um, my colleague Lauren was uh, in charge of coordinating this uh, with the, the uh, car manufacturers, the car industry in the US. Um, so we, we were trying to um, clarify, you know, what are the data flows uh, that um, go through um, communications when we have a, a smart car. Um, as you can see, it's quite complex. There, there are all sorts of uh, categories of data that are being collected and there are uh, all sorts of um, receivers of data. Um, so as far as data receivers are concerned, we can have um, another vehicle that receives data, so V2V, vehicle-to-vehicle communications. Uh, then uh, traffic lights might uh, receive data uh, in the context of smart cities, right? Uh, li uh, license plate readers will also receive data. Uh, the car manufacturer will receive data. Um, third parties like, think for example, uh, entertainment providers for the vehicle might receive data. Uh, toll boots, um, possibly, um, when uh, authorities would be involved. Emergency services, like in the European Union, we have the e-call system, right? Uh, um, 112, I think, is it? Um, so whenever there is an, uh, an accident uh, happening, uh, automatically, uh, the emergency services are being contacted. Uh, by, by vehicles. And then, of course, satellites also collect uh, a lot of data, um, geolocation data, for instance. Um, so, in terms of types of data, we also have uh, all sorts of categories. Um, location data, as I mentioned, infotainment uh, data, uh, data about the behavior of the driver, uh, behavior and uh, also biometrics data. Um, data about the vehicle's health, that's also data that uh, ultimately may be categorized personal um, if, you know, we will be able to pinpoint uh, the data subject. So the environment is incredibly complex and there are so many actors involved um, that it's, it's going to be difficult to talk a lot about solutions right now as we're starting to think about these issues. Uh, but um, we can at least think about what are the key challenges. As I mentioned, uh, a key challenge is that complexity, that entire complexity of the data flows and all the actors involved. Um, so we'll, when we have uh, a, a connected vehicle scenario, depending on uh, who we are <laughs> in that uh, flux of data, we need to think about what data is collected, or generated by the vehicle, uh, with whom it is shared, and for what purposes. We've seen how important defining the purpose is when we're talking about uh, GDPR and data protection law. And then, of course, the immediate uh, question is then who is responsible for what? You know, who is the data controller? Uh, who is the data processor? Is the car manufacturer data controller? And that's all? Uh, no. <laughs> there will be a lot of data controllers involved. Um, there, there might be in a joint controllership situation, that's another discussion. And then, of course, who are the processors? So who are those entities that um, process data, collect data, and do something to it on behalf of someone else? Uh, then there are a lot of challenges with regard to the rights of, of the person. So, for instance, how do you give notice about that entire complexity of uh, the data flow? Um, we don't necessarily have a screen, and in any case, we will not have a screen for all of the data flows. Uh, so how, how can notice be given? How can all of the details be given? Um, a very important issue is algorithmic transparency. One of the requirements of the GDPR is to give um, details about the logic involved in an uh, automated uh, decision-making process. So how do you explain all of that in a comprehensible, easily understandable way to the user? Obtaining valid consent, another difficult issue. Um, then you also have to think about what other lawful grounds you can use for what of those processing. Uh, 
Then there are also issues related to um, other rights of the data subject, like portability, because we will have, I mean, will, will um, a data subject be able to ask all of uh, his, her data from, uh, let's say, the car manufacturer, and then give that data to another car manufacturer? Would that be a possibility? Would that infringe on competition or not? So there are a lot of uh, challenges uh, like this to think about. Now, um, one of the points that will uh, be absolutely necessary to solve those challenges uh, will be data protection by design. We didn't get to talk a lot about it or almost at all about it earlier, but this is certainly one scenario where data protection by design is vital. Because if we don't think about all of these challenges when we are creating technology for uh, connected cars or when we are creating connected cars um, as such, uh, it will be impossible to comply with data protection legislation. So, for instance, when we're thinking about how do we give notice, perhaps, you know, the smart assistant from the car, uh, when you click a button, uh, will give a voice notice about uh, some details. Can I ask you, Gabriela, to take a little detour just because you did mention the data protection by design, which we didn't discuss, and I think we'd be remi remiss. I know one of the challenges that people have sometimes is say, oh, okay, I'm following all of the elements of the GDPR, but now on top of all of the requirements, I have a data protection by design requirement. What does that mean? Do I now have to add another what, what are the specific requirements uh, everywhere possible that I can give more privacy? I've got to give more privacy. Does that defeat some of the permissions that I just had? So you've done some useful yeah. work. What, what can you share uh, from what we understand today is the obligation on top of the other uh, regulations? Yeah, uh, thank you for that. It's, uh, so data protection by design, it's a legal obligation on its own right now. Until now, in this um, world of ours, of the privacy world, we've been talking about privacy by design, which was more of a policy goal, or something that you know it would be nice to have, wonderful. Well, now the GDPR creates an additional obligation, it's in Article 25, data protection by design and by default. And this has uh, a lot of complexity to it because one can uh, ask, and I know uh, I was asked by uh, Jules and Omer uh, about this, so what would you need to do to breach only that obligation and not any other of the obligations from uh, the GDPR? Um, and before replying to that, just to mention that the data protection by design obligation practically asks the controller, which is uh, one of the shortcomings of this uh, article, but so as the controller, not the processor, so as the controller to think about all the data protection sa safeguards from the design stage of a processing activity of a new, new product and so on, and then also through the life cycle of that uh, project. Um, so they have to think about data minimization from the very beginning. They have to uh, put in place uh, pseudonymization as a safeguard or other safeguards. Let me give you one good example yeah. that I've been uh, using. Um, very often you download an app and the app says, can I access your contacts because I want to see who else of your friends is using this app so you can communicate with them or and so forth, right? Very nice, very friendly, it's, it's essential to do that. So you could do what many apps do, which is upload then your entire contacts, right, in order to match it against which users they have registered. Right? You gave permission, access the contacts. Or what has become better practice, but I would say now is obligated because of the privacy by design uh, requirement, is you could upload their contacts only in a hashed format and match it against the hashed version of your, um, uh, your information, and then only in the places where you have a match do you then uh, go ahead and, and access the information and, and say, do you want to connect? And you don't ever hold and keep the full contacts that uh, I gave you access to, right? I would argue, since that is feasible, it's not a 
unique thing. It's already a good practice to, to do this. Um, Apple pushes it and so forth. I would argue this is a place where a regulator would already take action against you uh, about what is you know, a, a failure of privacy by design when there is a clearly known, friendlier, feasible, technical way to do so and you yeah. do the easy one which creates great, greater risk. Yeah, well, the, the data protection by design obligation talks about taking into account the state of the art of technology uh, when deciding about um, the measures you can put in place. And to give you an example of what, how you can breach data protection by design obligation by itself, um, think of um, a, an organization that puts together or creates a platform, like a social media platform for the internal purposes of enterprises. To, like um, employees to communicate with uh, each other. Uh, and uh, this organization doesn't think that, you know, it might, some of those uh, users uh, will at one point ask for erasure of their data. And it's, um, they don't make um, it possible for the data to be completely erased from the system. Uh, then if they receive a request, uh, to erasure, they might say, well, we can't do it. It's impossible to erase data from our product. In that case, it will not only be a breach of uh, uh, the right to erasure uh, related obligations, but also a breach of the data protection by design obligation, which will aggravate it because uh, exactly because of this obligation in Article 25, they would have to think about implementing the rights from the design stage. So it will not, there will be no excuse saying that, I'm sorry, technically it's impossible to comply with your uh, uh, right. So that's one example. And this is why, uh, even if the scenarios are so complex, solutions have to be thought through uh, from the design stage. Uh, and then, of course, I put there a, a little cloud. What about the ethics questions of auto autonomous cars decisions? Well, this is something that air protection law certainly does not solve. Uh, this is uh, a, a completely different uh, issue. So, you know, uh, if it's, uh, we have an autonomous vehicle that uh, has no choice but to, uh, you know, go in through a, a, a group of kindergarten kids or a group of uh, grannies. What do, where do they go? Where, where does it go? Their data protection law does not go uh, into this. No. Uh, so some of the challenges, you know, we can tackle them thinking about all of these things from the very beginning, but certainly most of the challenges will uh, need to be solved by guidance. There is a, a, a lack of guidance and actual cases, enforcement cases in this space. However, we do have some uh, official guidance here, and the CNIL, the French Data Protection Authority, uh, published a guidance last year, um, and they also recently translated it into English, so it, it would be available uh, to, to all of us here. Um, they did provide some uh, useful directions, so for example, uh, with the issue of who is controller uh, in a connected car scenario, they said that the service provider who processes vehicle data to send the driver traffic information and eco driving messages, as well as alerts regarding the functioning of the vehicle, that would be the controller. So the service provider would be the controller, which means that, you know, that goes way beyond the car manufacturer. So whoever provides a specific service for the car, that uh, would be the controller. Then the data subject, and this is where things go interesting, the data subject can be the driver, who is the main driver or occasional driver, can be pa the passenger or the owner of the vehicle, depending on who processes data in the context of what service. Um, there's also very good gui guidance on the lawful grounds that can be used um, in, in this document. And it's made clear by the CNIL that all the GDPR lawful grounds can be applicable depending on the context. So certainly uh, you can process data based on legitimate interests when uh, the context allows that. Um, a lot of the data related to connected cars can be processed on contract. Uh, and of course we have uh, the consent lawful ground. 
And in this case, specifically in this case, the vital interests of, of the data subject can also be applied in some uh, scenarios. So, uh, to give you some examples, for instance, when data is processed for model optimization and product improvements by the car manufacturers, uh, legitimate interests could be used as a lawful ground, uh, provided there are some safeguards uh, brought into uh, the mix, uh, like uh, pseudonymization and data minimization, given as examples. Uh, for accidentology studies, uh, the CNIL says you would need consent. Uh, for uh, any commercial use of the vehicle's data, um, usually you can rely on contract. Um, for fighting theft, accessing geolocation data, they say you would need consent. And in any case, the guidance um, does a pretty good job uh, on going on detailing a lot three scenarios. I will just go. Uh, well, the e-privacy, talking about lawful grounds for processing, the e-privacy directive will also be relevant in this context because sometimes we may have, I mean, the, the, the vehicle uh, is certainly a terminal equipment. And if we use technologies similar to, cook, similar to cookies to access data from the vehicle, then consent would be needed and uh, we would go into the e-privacy directive um, scenario. But what I wanted to talk more about was... Uh, but you can see why some of the e-privacy conversations have gotten very complicated because clearly if I want by default vehicle to vehicle communication or vehicle to infrastructure communication, I need everybody in the system. Uh, if I'm relying on consent, uh, it, it's not going to work. Uh, uh, and um, the regulators are uncomfortable with introducing legitimate interest because of the broad range of subjective uh, uses for this uh, sort of data because this is considered communications data. It's really the essence of uh, uh, human rights covered data, right? We all recognize that your communication typically gets a higher level, so is legitimate interest acceptable? Uh, so they're looking at very sort of specific carve-outs or suggesting that, well, you can get legislation. Uh, we, you know, in the auto world, uh, we'll need maybe implementing legislation, right? To industry or to companies uh, or governments that are looking to implement this, it's not so exciting to say, well, you'll have to get sector-specific uh, legislation. So these are some of the hard questions. Or let me take another example. Uh, I'm sure when you turned on your device uh, for the first time, many of you gave permission to the platforms to collect the local Wi-Fi networks that are near you in order to, someone didn't, someone said no, okay. But many of us clearly are saying, yes, track the Wi-Fi networks near me, build a giant global database so that the next time people turn on their phone and your phone's uh, Wi-Fi sees the local uh, Wi-Fi network, okay, we know we're exactly in front of the Dan Panorama, we know we're exactly in front of you know such and such hotel, right? There's clearly great value, but some of those Wi-Fi networks are people's homes, right? Our personal router, uh, SSIDs, and other information like that. So who gave permission to scan? You gave permission maybe that information about your phone, but nobody got permission from the personal homes and those Wi-Fi networks, right? But if that's off base because nobody knocked on the door and gave them permission, you significantly break one of the most useful pieces of the geolocation system that our phones rely on, right? And so working through some of these issues without the privacy critics in the parliament and elsewhere feeling you've now opened up all sorts of marketing and other robust and maybe unacceptable uses, um, can they carve out each of these uses? And then every time someone comes, we bring some more. And so this is sort of what's been one of the big complications. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah. So just before moving to the next uh, scenario, uh, just wanted to uh, highlight that uh, this guidance I, I was presenting a bit goes into three different scenarios, which again highlights how complex all of these uh, issues uh, are. 
so the first scenario would be uh, data that's collected by the vehicle but that are not transmitted to any service provider. So everything is collected and processed locally in the vehicle. The data is not even transmitted to the manufacturer or any other service provider. Then uh, in another scenario, the data are transmitted to the service provider without automatic action being triggered in the vehicle. So the data just goes uh, somewhere out there, uh, but then nothing happens with uh, the vehicle, with the car uh, in real time. And then the last scenario is about data transmitted to the service provider, to a service provider, uh, and that um, immediately triggers a service in the vehicle. And um, I would highly recommend if you are in this uh, sector to, to go look for this guidance because you will see that it has uh, a lot of purposes um, and lawful grounds uh, mentioned for all of these three scenarios. And I think it will be uh, very useful. Okay, artificial intelligence. We go this from is, hard to harder. Yeah. <laughs> This is a whole universe in and of itself. Um, artificial intelligence, as you know, has many, many applications. Um, some of them you know, come to mind immediately. We were just talking about connected cars. Um, autonomous driving is clearly one of the examples people think about first when they think about artificial intelligence. Um, but it's worth remembering that this is, um, AI tools can be applied um, in virtually any context. And actually what we see in practice is that the AI that you see most often is not the AI that's interacting with the individual directly. Um, of course, there are the autonomous vehicles, there are the, um, uh, in the US, sentencing guidelines that are being decided by um, AI. So there are these examples where there's the direct interaction with the individual. But actually, what we see most often in practice is companies are selling their AI to other companies. And this raises a, um, a foundational question for data protection, and that's what obligations apply. Uh, are we a controller or are we a processor? And so um, to highlight this, I want to think about one example. Um, so imagine uh, you use AI to do um, spell check and translation, and you sell this. You maybe make it available for free to consumers. Clearly, you're a controller. But you also um, sell this to businesses. That's, that's where, you, where you make your money from. Um, and uh, all of a sudden you run into this controller processor distinction almost immediately. Because in order to do this spell check and translation, uh, your clients are going to be giving you access to lots and lots of personal data, but also confidential business information. Uh, and so they're going to want to force you into this processor box in order to keep that data um, secure for them. And um, the example above sort of shows this too. This is. Um, DeepMind, which is Google's AI tool, which they um, sold to, to NHS, the health provider in the UK, and positioned themselves as a processor for this. Uh, so the idea was that DeepMind would help with um, using, uh, introducing AI for diagnostics. And ultimately, the information com commissioner investigated this. And as is not surprising for people who, who've worked with AI or, or have awareness of this, in order for AI to run, you need a phenomenal amount of data that you need to be able to test in lots of different circumstances. And so DeepMind was, yes, performing a service to the NHS, but it was also continuing to process that data um, for its own purposes to perfect and learn from it and improve its algorithms. Um, and so the information commissioner said, hold on a second, DeepMind hasn't taken its full compliance responsibilities here. It's not a processor. In fact, uh, for this portion of learning it's doing on the outside, it's, it's acting much more like a controller. Um, so that's, that's the first key challenge with AI, um, is how do you offer these services um, in the context of a business while at the same time being able to take the data and learn from it and improve your algorithms. The second challenge we want to highlight is around lawfulness. And this is probably the one that we think of most when we think about the key data protection concerns of AI. Um, how do we make sure that the processing is fair and lawful and proportionate? And how do we inform people about uh, what it is that the algorithm is doing? Um, the GDPR says that we need to give individuals notice of meaningful information about the logic involved in automated decisions. 
Uh, at the moment, there doesn't seem to be the technical ability to do this at a meaningful level. Uh, a lot of these algorithms are being released um, and learning from themselves, and we can't necessarily say exactly what's happening um, within the black box. And so how do we meet that requirement to explain what's happening, and how do we also verify that we've done it in a lawful way? Uh, there is a debate around whether the GDPR provides a retroactive right of explanation. So under Article 15, which gives the, the right of access to individuals, um, there's a right to ask for an explanation of the meaning involved, um, the meaningful information about the logic involved in the decision. So this is the same language that um, is used in the notice requirement. But there's an argument that because this also applies in the access context, uh, that meaningful information would have to be specific to what the individual is requesting. So can we give that data subject, that person, an explanation as to why the, um, the, the algorithm came out with the decision it did um, for that specific individual? And there's a, a tremendous amount of debate right now as to whether that right applies and, and how meaningful the explanation has to be. Um, yeah. Uh, one, one other significant challenge when we talk about the GDPR and um, AI and all forms of AI um, is that uh, prohibition uh, we mentioned earlier, Car Carolina and I, uh, on uh, automated decision making that is solely based on automated processing and that might include profiling but that necessarily has to have a significant impact on the individual. Uh, it will likely be the case that a lot of the AI applications will be in this category. We, l more than likely, there will not be um, uh, you know, a human uh, involved uh, in at least part of the processing uh, that takes place within uh, the AI application. Um, and then the question would be, uh, in order to look at this prohibition, the question would be what are the types of effects that are, um, that will be, um, so the individuals will be subjected to. Um, as you gave the example earlier in the U.S. with even uh, you know this legal court decisions <laughs> that might have been uh, based solely on processing by AI, an AI application. Well, that's certainly a very significant uh, type of decision, but we won't necessarily need a legal effect on the person for this prohibition to be triggered. We will also uh, it will be enough to have a significant effect. Uh, as Carolina mentioned earlier, there are still a lot of debates about what significant means. Um, the data protection authorities made it clear that that doesn't necessarily mean a negative effect, but just to give you an example, um, think of um, an automated system used to exclude uh, applications for certain jobs, so certain job applications. Um, could be excluded uh, by um, uh, su such an automated processing, and that's certainly a significant effect on the person. Um, students that apply to university programs and that are excluded automatically by such uh, processes could also um, be covered. But I, I, would, I cannot think of an example of a positive significant uh, yeah. Effect. I'm it, not sure if you thought about this. Well, I just want to point out one other thing here, which is that when, when we think about what are significant um, automated decisions and significant effects, often people are thinking about what's the impact for a specific individual. Uh, but the guidance from the EDPB suggests that broader societal impacts, yeah. even if it's not a significant impact for any one individual, um, could potentially um, breach this prohibition. And that's where um, the behavioral advertising example is, is the one they give. So um, if you were targeting discriminate, discriminating, um, discriminatory advertising to people, um, even if it didn't necessarily have a significant effect for any individual who received it, but if there was a broader bias and discrimination, then that, that could trigger this prohibition as well. Yeah, so think of um, real estate ads targeted uh, to certain categories of persons and ex expressly uh, not served to uh, a certain ethnicity, let's say, you know, 
uh, or, a um, or a group um, that's uh, based on, on religious views or, or, or one of other categories. Um, so th th that's one of the examples. So what does this prohibition say? It is a prohibition, but you can still engage in such automated decision making if it is necessary to enter into or for the performance of a contract between the controller and the data subject uh, them, uh, itself, herself, sorry, herself, himself, or the data subject explicitly consents to this processing or it's authorized by a law of one of the member states or by EU law. Um, so if one of these three conditions are met, this type of decision making can uh, happen uh, however, it would be very um, quite well, quite difficult again to, uh, for instance, to obtain explicit consent because it would be difficult to inform the data subjects uh, about what's going on in an AI application. So, this again goes to some of the challenges. So, so what do you need to do? What there's this other piece that you need to look at. Um, are you using appropriate mathematical and statistical procedures to prevent discrimination and bias? Um, unfortunately, this is all the regulation says about this, um, and um, there are lots and lots of pages written about how you go about pre preventing discrimination and bias in algorithmic decision making. Uh, but the point to know practically is that you should use um, best practices here and state of the art and you really need to test to make sure that there isn't um, bias and discrimination. So to wrap this, because we have to move to Israel, um, uh, good reading, the Norwegian Data Protection uh, Authority did a very, very, they're a very technically oriented uh, bunch, and even though they don't sit as part of the Article 29 EPDP, they're respected for their tech chops for sure. Um, they did a very good, a, if any of you are not deep in the weeds on machine learning, or you want to know enough just to know what you need to know for privacy compliance, they've done a very good sort of explainer. Uh, data sill, I think they're called. Data sill, the Norwegian Data Authority. Uh, and then... Data sill, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, well, Norwegian DPA. And they've also then assessed where are the issues where there's particular challenges around limiting purposes, about whether it's research, and so on and so forth. Anyway. Um, Gabriella, Gabe, thank you for tremendous, tremendous uh, effort. Thank you.